Good morning. Hey, I just want to uh, teach you guys something here real quick. Uh, you may or may not know this, but you can get the Bible in a lot of different translations. So you can get it uh, where it sounds more uh, proper, uh, the old King James version of the Bible, or a lot of people today, the most common one would be the New International Version. Well, last week, what you heard in preparation for that baptism is the TTV version, and that would be today teenage vernacular, and so a dunk is a baptism. Okay, just want to make sure in case you were sitting there wondering, did he get baptized or dunked? He got baptized, okay? So I just want to clarify that. Hey, uh, sometimes I start by saying, hey, I got some good news and some bad news. Today, it's all good news, all right? And before we jump into that, I need two volunteers, but I need very, very specific volunteers. I need one volunteer who is really good at destroying things or wrecking things or just creating absolute chaos in something. Do I have a volunteer who's really good at ruining things or wrecking them? Where, where? Right over here. Okay, come on up here. Right over here. Come on up. Yep. I don't know if you volunteered or got volunteered, but come on up here. All right, tell everybody your name real quick. Marley. Say it again. Marley. Marley, awesome. Okay, now I need one more volunteer. Now, this one's different. This one needs to be somebody who's really good at fixing things. You know, they, they can just take something and it can be broken, it can be worn out, it can be destroyed, it can be whatever, but they're just good at fixing things. Do I have a volunteer? I see a hand over here. All right, come on up. All right, tell them your name real quick. I'm Logan. Logan. Logan, say it again so they know it. Logan. All right, Logan, hold this for a minute. Okay, Maya, you're really good at destroying things, right? I want you to just destroy that can. You can do whatever you want to it. You can ask me to fix that? Wow. 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 Okay, hey, that deserves a standing ovation. Okay, get up on your feet. Wow. 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 Okay, you did so good. But uh, something out of that box and then go have a seat. Thank you, Marley. All right. Now, Logan, here's your part. You're really good at fixing things, so fix that. Okay. I could have picked a clean one. <laughs> okay, come on up. Okay. We need a little bit now, of tape. Yeah. Let me, ask your, let me ask your unbiased opinion. Did he restore this to its original shape and form or make it better? We got a couple percent to go. Okay. Did, is this better than it was when it started? So did he fully fix this? Okay. Thank you, Logan, for helping us out. You don't get anything out of the box. I can take the garbage. Okay. Now, in, uh, in defense of Logan, and it's easier to destroy things than it is to repair things. But I'm thankful that we have a God who is able to repair the things that we destroy. So let's jump into Romans chapter 5, and we're going to see this play out today. So Romans chapter 5, we're going to take this in about three or four sections. So you can follow along in your Bible, or we'll have it on the screen, whatever is uh, best for you. And uh, let's just jump right in, and we'll do the first five verses. Here it goes. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. 
And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who had been given to us. So in that passage were four key words, just right after each other, and that is suffering, perseverance, character, and hope. So those are up on the screen. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to somebody next to you, and I want you to tell them which of those four things you wish you had more of in your life. What, what, which of those four things you think, man, I'll take all of that I can get. Okay, now, now I want you to turn to that person and I want you to share with them which of those do you want absolutely as little as possible of? What's the one that, man, you could do without? Okay, well, let's find out what you guys said. I think I know the answer to the first one, but let, let's just double check. I'm going to guess that most of you said you want more hope or character. If you said one of those two, raise your hand. Okay, now, the next one, I know I'm going to get this one right. Okay, I'm guessing the one that you said you want absolutely as little as possible or none of is suffering. Let me see your hands. Okay, now... Let me just share with you, you all got it wrong. Okay, here's why. Because that's the mindset that we have. We have a mindset that says when we're suffering, we want to get rid of it as soon as possible. But what Paul just said here is suffering does what? Produces perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope. So the reality of it is, if you and I want more character in our life, if we want more hope in our life, we need to learn how to embrace suffering rather than sit and try to figure out how to get rid of it. Now, let's be honest with ourselves. Most of us, when it comes to suffering, we get kind of whiny about it and we complain about it and we say it's not fair and it changes our voice. You know, we say, But what Paul is saying here is, you ought to glory in your sufferings. Oh, my goodness. I don't know that I have ever gloried in a suffering. But the whole point is this. You and I oftentimes see suffering as a punishment, as a we did something wrong or an absence of God's good. If I'm being so faithful to God, why isn't everything in my life good? Rather than seeing it for what it is, in this particular passage, in this context, what it's saying is it, it's a teacher. It's a curriculum. So what if the next time you suffered, rather than trying to figure out how to get rid of it as soon as possible, what if you said, God, I want to get everything I can out of this lesson because I don't want this lesson again? What if we looked at our suffering and said, you know what, I think there's something that can come out of this that's good if I look for it and if I notice it. Here's the thing I can tell you from my experience. My most powerful understanding of my relationship with God have come out of pain and suffering. They have not come out of times when everything is going smoothly and everything I touch works out and just blessing after blessing. Those are not the times where I seem to sit and listen and look for God the same as I do when I'm going through a suffering or a struggle or a hardship. So I think you and I would really benefit if we would learn to lean into that so rather than seek a quick end to suffering, we should look to learn from it. Now, this isn't just Paul's idea. I'm going to jump ahead real quick to James chapter 1, verse 2. I want to share with you a similar thought. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face a trial of many kinds. In other words, even James is saying, look, this is not something to be avoided. This is not a curse. This is not a bad thing. This is not a punishment. This is something you ought to lean into and realize God cares enough about you to let you suffer. I think sometimes we've misunderstood it, and sometimes we think when someone else is suffering, we think, well, clearly they must have some kind of a sin issue going on. That's why they're suffering. Or sometimes we feel like when we're suffering, it's like, where's God at? And maybe God is saying, I am more prevalent in your life right now than you have any clue of. I just hope you'll look to me. I hope you'll look for me. I hope you'll be aware of what I'm trying to develop in you. If so, 
you would embrace this understanding that this suffering right now is going to give you a gift. And that, that gift is perseverance, character, and hope. Let's continue on. So pick it up, Romans chapter 5, pick it up in verse 6. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for who? For the ungodly. Can we all agree that the ungodly need Christ to die for them? Can I get an amen? amen? We all agree with that. Okay. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for who? Do you realize what Paul just did? He just called you and I ungodly. Hmm. Now, we all saw it. We all said, amen, the ungodly need Christ to die for them. But sometimes we don't want to acknowledge the fact that I need Christ to die for me. And that's exactly what Paul is getting at here. It's making it real clear. It's not just the ungodly, it's us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now, did you catch when Jesus died for us? While we were still sinners. You know the best time for you and I to turn to Jesus for forgiveness? While we're still sinners. Jesus didn't wait for us to get our act together. Jesus didn't wait for you to get rid of that sin issue. Jesus didn't wait for you to get your life together and to get some of the mess out of it and then say, okay, now I'm willing to die for you. But sometimes we get to a place where we say, you know what, I feel embarrassed or ashamed or unvaluable or unworthy of Jesus' forgiveness, so I want to get my act together before I say I'll surrender my life to him. Jesus is making it really clear when he died for us. Paul is making it really clear. You don't need to get your act together to come to Jesus. You come to Jesus so that he can help you get your act together. You know, this would be like you or I saying, well, let me wait till I get well, and then I'll go to the doctor. Why would you do that? You go to the doctor, why? To help you get well and to understand even what's wrong with us. Sometimes you and I need to understand that we just need to come to Jesus and go, Jesus, I don't even know why I'm doing the stupid things I'm doing. I don't even know why I keep repeating the same mistake. Jesus, I know this isn't right, and yet I still keep doing this. Or maybe this is all new to you, and you say, man, I had no idea how many things I had done wrong in my life before. This is all brand new to me. And Jesus is saying, that's all right, come here. I died for you the way you are. Come here and accept me the way you are, and then let's work on this together. Let's pick it back up. I want to reread verse 10. Again, I wanted to hone in on this for just a moment. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Now I want to read that same verse for you in a different translation called Contem- Contemporary English Version. Just because I want you to hear it with different words. Listen. Let it soak in. Even when we were God's enemies, he made peace with us because his son died for us. Yet something even greater than friendship is ours. Now we are at peace with God. We will be saved by the life of his son. What Paul is saying here is through Jesus' death, he reconciled us, or he made peace between us and God. And then he goes on to say, that's not even the best part. The best part is, through his resurrection, he gives you a life. He gives you a life. He gives you life to the fullest. So let me help explain this. Sometimes I think we take the approach that, okay, so now that I've accepted Jesus' forgiveness, Now I just kind of live out the rest of my life and I wait for heaven. And heaven is the reward I get for having accepted Jesus. The actual truth is this. 
when you accept Jesus, your eternity and a relationship with God begins in that moment. And so you are already in the process of living with God in relationship in the kingdom of God while you wait for heaven. What Paul is trying to say is it's not just through his death that he made peace between you and God. It is through his resurrection that he has launched a relationship, an ongoing daily relationship between you and God. Now let's pick it back up in verse 12. We're going to read verse 12, and I'm going to jump ahead a couple of verses to 15 to kind of tie this whole thought together. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, turn to the person next to you and explain that. Okay, just kidding, just kidding. Just making sure you're listening, making sure you're listening. Now, this is where it's going to get really messy. That section that we just read is a very complicated and yet a very simple section. It's complicated in that there are scholars who are far smarter than I am. Can I get an amen? My wife was really loud last service. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, there, there's a lot of different scholars who have a lot of different views on this section. And we're going to talk about those just real quickly. But then what I wanted to not miss is the part that Paul is saying, but this is far more important. Don't miss it. You can try to get this. You can try to understand that. That's good. Don't miss this, okay? So let's talk about what this section means uh, based on different scholars and what they would say. So one view is this, that when Adam sinned, all mankind became guilty of sin. So in that view, the moment you are born, you are born guilty of sin. The view is called original sin. Now, why is this in, uh, important? Why do we need to understand This is why many faith baptize infants. Because the idea is, if we're born guilty of sin, I want to have my baby baptized so that there's no way they could die before they ever have a chance to grow up and accept Jesus on their own. So that's where that teaching comes from. That's where that idea comes from. Here's the thing that I want you to see and not miss this. This is Paul, just in the book of Romans so far, in the last couple of chapters. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul says this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And again, here in this chapter, chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through the one man and death through sin, and in that same way, death came to all people because all have sinned. So here's the thing I want to uh, make sure you dial in on that. You and I need our sin forgiven, not Adam's. You and I need to have the sin that we've committed made right through what Jesus did on the cross for us to be at peace with God and to have a relationship with him that had no sin separating us. 
The second view is this one. The second view is that we all inherit what's called a sin nature. So uh, in my uh, college, there were two professors that I had quite a few classes with, and one of them would say, he doesn't think that we inherited a sin nature from Adam. The other professor would say, if that professor had to raise my children, he would believe we have a sin nature. Okay, so here's the idea, or here's where this thought comes from. The thought comes like this. Nobody seems to have to teach a two-year-old to lie. Nobody teaches a two-and-a-half-year-old who's touching something when they're told to stop. Nobody teaches them, wait till I turn and I'm not looking anymore and then do it again. No, nobody seems to teach that. So the idea is that all of us have a sin nature. In other words, we have this thing that almost seems to draw us to or lean toward that. Uh, let me give another word picture of this. I, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I remember, man, way back even when I was a kid, I remember watching movies, and it would be a crime movie or a murder mystery or something, and I remember at different points in the movie going, well, that was stupid. I would have done this. And I'm like, why, why am I thinking that? Why, why am I trying to figure out how to commit this murder and not get caught? You know, why am I trying to figure out how I would have stole the gold from Fort Knox and, you know, I'd be wealthy? And so the idea is there's something in us that seems to be drawn toward that. So one of the question that comes up with the idea of a sin nature is, did Adam have a sin nature? In other words, was he created with one because he's the first of all mankind, or did he not have one? Now, on the one hand, the truth of the matter is, in some ways, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, but here's what I would say on that. I personally, I don't think Adam was created with a sin nature. I think the difference between Adam and us is this. Adam needed an outside agency to tempt him to sin. By that outside agency, what I'm talking about is the snake or Satan, you and I seem to be able to be drawn to or think about or uh, imagine sin without any influence whatsoever. We can be sitting by ourselves. We can be sitting on the back porch. We can be just driving down the road. And all of a sudden, we can have this crazy idea about something incredibly sinful. And then at the same time, we can be embarrassed that we even had that thought. And so the idea or the concept there is that from Adam, we all inherited a sin nature. The third, uh, and neither the three most common, not necessarily in this order, the third one is this, that death affects all people and nature from the time of Adam going forward. This is a view, by the way, that uh, I don't know anybody that disagrees with it. A everybody said that from Adam forward, every living thing was going to experience death. And that was one of the consequences of what Adam and Eve did. So I want to jump forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Why? Because Paul is talking about this same concept in a different letter. So he's writing to the church in Corinth, and he's written 14 chapters so far in this letter to them. And then he gets to chapter 15. I'm going to read the very beginning of it, and then we're going to jump to the end of this same chapter. So the very beginning of chapter 15 said this in verse 1 through 4. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received and passed on to you as of first importance. What does first importance mean? It means first importance. Okay, so it means... Everything I've said to you, I hope you've been listening. I hope you paid attention for the first 14 chapters of this letter, 1 Corinthians. But here's the most important thing. This is priority number one. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. In other words, what Paul is saying is everything else, you, good, understand that, do your best to live that out. Here's the number one thing. Don't ever miss this. This is the most important thing you need to know. If you're new to your faith, if you're new to trying to understand Jesus, if you're new to being at church or reading your Bible, the most important thing you need to understand, or that hopefully you will soon learn, 
is that Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life and died for our sins, was buried in a grave, and came back to life. Why is that important? If he didn't die for our sins, we would have to die for them. And if he wasn't able to bring his body back to life, what makes him think he can do that with ours? So that's the most important thing Paul says. Now we're going to jump to the end, and he's going to tie back to that theme that we were just looking at in Romans. He said this, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Christ all die, so in Christ all will, did I say that right? So in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. This is the point of what Paul's getting at. This is the whole point that he's getting at with, with chapter six here. Whatever happened to you and I and to all of mankind because of Adam's sin was more than taken care of by what Jesus did on the cross and through his resurrection. So whatever Marley did to that can was more than taken care of by what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus was far more effective than Logan was. Okay, so you and I may look at our lives and say, you know what, there's a lot of things we've done to destroy our life. There's a lot of sin that we've committed. There's a lot of really poor choices we've made over time. What Paul wants you and I to hear loud and clear is Jesus' grace is far significant to take care of anything and everything you've ever done. Your many trespasses, Jesus Christ is taken care of. So here's your takeaway for this week. God's grace is infinitely greater for good than Adam's sin is for evil. Let me say it again. God's grace is infinitely greater for good than Adam's sin for evil. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I want to, I want to close with one last thing. I, I want to help you with your next move. I want to help you with a homework assignment, okay? This comes from being married to an educator. But here's your homework, Okay, now I want to give it to you for a reason, but I'm going to ask you for five days in a row to read chapter six, but I want you to read it differently each time. Here's why. One, it will prepare you for next week's message, but even more importantly than that, what I want to do is I want to teach you how to read the Bible and get as much as you can out of it. I, I hope you're like me. There are times where I hear somebody teach a particular passage, and I'm like, Man, that was brilliant. I, I would have never seen all that. How, how did they get all of that? And because they just have learned how to read, they've learned how to look, they've learned how to pull out of it rather than learn how to read it and check a box, okay? So I want to help you do that this week. If you didn't grab a bulletin on your way in, you can grab one on your way out. That way you'll have these in front of you. On Monday, here's what I want to, keep, what I want to encourage you to do. Read chapter 6 and just look for what are the key thoughts, Okay, not necessarily what, what is each word, but man, what are the key thoughts? What, what seems to be the thing that this chapter is trying to say to me? Or maybe there's more, multiple things, but just look for what are the key thoughts. On Tuesday, look for uh, sin and grace. What does it say about sin? What does it say about grace? How do those two interact with each other? How are those two different? Uh, is there more of one or more of the other? More and more powerful, one more? Just look at sin and grace as you read it. On Wednesday... Look for death and life. What does it say about death? What does it say about life? What causes death? What brings life? You know, all those things. Just keep looking through those, for those two words. Uh, third day, look for uh, the law and grace. Law and grace. Law and grace. And then on Friday, look for what it says about slaves or being a slave or slavery. Okay? So... That's your homework for this week. But again, I hope you understand. I'm trying to, one, help you for next week. More than that, I'm trying to help you understand how is it that when you read the Bible, you can go, oh, my goodness, it just jumps off the page of me. I, I see a lot every time I read it rather than I don't read it because I don't get anything out of it. Okay? One of the keys to getting something out of it is asking it, what, what's it trying to say? Inviting yourself to get something out of it rather than trying to get through it and be able to check the box. Let me pray for us, and then I want to share two quick things with you. Heavenly Father, thank you that 
your grace is far, far, far more powerful than all of our sin. All of our sin put together doesn't compare to your grace. What Jesus did on the cross is uh, just infinitely more powerful in our life than anything and everything else put together. God, thank you for that. Help us to embrace that. Help us to celebrate that. Help us to enjoy that. Help us to uh, tell other people about that. And God, thank you. Thank you for what Jesus did and the way that you use that to bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.